Fantastic. All right. Cool. Let me share my screen. Okay. Yes, we do our presentations on Figma. Fittingly. Um, anyway. Okay, here we are. Can y'all see? Okay. Yes. Cool. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second UI UX lesson, which is on UI design principles. So last week we covered UI versus UX, um, how they work together, just generally like the topic of design. Today, we're gonna be covering the user interface portion. And then on Monday, I believe, we're gonna be covering the user experience portion. And then we'll be doing like a more advanced Figma workshop, right? That's still happening? Okay, so. <laughs> okay, yeah. And um, like we said earlier, yeah, time in a six, so you'll be out today, but it'll just be me and Jasmine here today. So we'll try our best to amend um, Timon's hole that he's left in our um, group. So yeah. Okay, today on our agenda, we're going to be talking about user interface um, principles. So fonts, images, colors, basically all the aesthetic stuff that like makes your website look nice, um, just visually. So yeah, cool. Let us get started. So UI design. Um, UI design has a few different purposes. Um, basically the user interface, uh, we kind of covered this briefly last lesson, but it's the space where interactions between humans and machines occur. And that's a little bit um, abstract, but basically it's, um, it's just the, like the interface is just what you see and what people can like click on, like the buttons they click on, the colors that they see, like the little illustrations they see. Um, and according to Adobe, um, note it down here, Basically UI design, uh, the way that you like design your interface, you should keep in mind these four things. So first you should place users in control of the interface. So making sure that everything is like usable, which is something we'll go more in depth into on Monday. Uh, make it comfortable to interact with the product. So like no like clashing colors, like really ugly fonts, um, reducing cognitive loads. So that's just the amount of information that the users like have to uh, deal with and process and then make user interfaces consistent. So you're kind of creating predictability and like uh, reinforcing your brand like through your interface. Um, so yeah, those are the four things that you wanna keep in mind when you're designing an interface. And of course there's other things, but I think a lot of principles like fall into these four categories. So we'll start off by talking about fonts and feel free to interrupt me if you have questions or drop them in the chat um, and I'll stop your questions every now and then. So yeah, fonts. Um, fonts are, you know, like, I think they can kind of make or break your site sometimes. Like if you have a really nicely designed site, but like a just really trash font, like, you know, it's not gonna look good for you. Um, but we'll be talking about like the anatomy of a font and how to pick and um, choose fonts correctly and how to make them work together. So the typeface of a font is basically like the name of the font. So for example, like in Google Docs, like the default typeface is Arial. Um, you know, Times New Roman is another popular one, uh, Comic Sans, which I hope you never touch. Um, and on the right here, we have this font. I think it's probably called Carib. Um, I'm not really sure what these mean, but we can just ignore it for now and pretend. Um, the weight is just how bold the font is. So like when you want to create emphasis, you want to like have a higher weight. And weight is denoted in like CSS by like numbers, in, like a hundreds, like multiples of a hundred. So like, for example, like an 800 weight font is bolder than a 500 weight font. And then we have size, which you should follow some rules when determining what size to use for your fonts. Typically on desktop, the lower bound is 15 pixels. And this is like, you know, if you go anything, if you go anywhere less than that, like your user will have a hard time reading it on desktop. And then for mobile, it's 12 pixels. Um, and then serif is a property of a font. So fonts that are sans serif basically just mean like they don't have curly things at the end. Sorry, that's a little bit um, bad wording, but like curly things are just like these, basically like Times New Roman is a serif font. Um, and they have like these little things at the end of each stroke. And then sans serif is like this font, for example, where like, it's just a line. Um, Tracking is the space between letters. So depending on like how big your tracking is, it can create like um, a sense of like airiness or like clusteredness in your page. And then line height is also something you should keep in mind, just the space between like the lines of your text and 
usually you should have somewhere around 130%. Um, and I think that's 130% of like the height of your text. Um, I think that's what it measures. But usually this is good for making sure that everything doesn't look like it's super stacked on top of each other. Um, you can go higher, wouldn't re recommend going much lower, but it's just like a general like bound. Um, so as for some font rules, um, like I mentioned earlier, we have serif fonts and sans serif. And usually a good rule to follow is to use one serif font and one sans serif. This is not like a hard and fast rule, um, but basically like use one font that has a little bit more like character to it and like kind of maybe contributes like your brand, um, like the design of your brand. And then one sans serif that's just super easy to read and like you won't have any problems like digesting when it comes to like a lot of big blocks of text that you want people to be able to like process fast, right? Um, some of these like, okay, like for example, on the top here, we have um, like this super scripty font and then like a serif font and it looks a little bit busy. And then on the bottom here, we have uh, two sans serif fonts that makes everything just look kind of blocky, a little bland. Um, I think these are the same font, just in different weight. And then here in the middle, we have like a good mix of like this, which has a little bit of personality and then this um, super readable and like clean, simple font at the bottom that like actually tells the user like details. Um, and yeah, avoid using fonts that are super gimmicky or weird, um, unless it's like for a specific purpose. Like if you're making a weird website, like go ahead, use Comic Sans, but typically like in a professional setting, you wanna avoid like using any fonts that are just like funny or like wingdings or something like that. Um, simplicity is key. Uh, this kind of speaks for itself. You know, you don't need to rely on your font for like the, um, the design of your site. Um, you can, you know, it's definitely something to keep in mind, but it's not like the end all be all of your a good design. And then, yeah, stick to two or three fonts. I'd say usually two is enough. Um, there are some certain cases where, you know, three fonts are necessary but you usually don't wanna go over that because then it just kind of gets confusing and it doesn't really create like this cohesive look in your website. Cool. And then saucing it, saucing, oh gosh. Um, saucing and installing the font. Sorry, these slides are from last semester. I don't know what I was on, but um, these are some good websites. I think this one's Behance, right? I don't know. It, I think so, okay. Um, Dauphon is a good one. Yeah, and Google Fonts is like, a very like standard one. Um, a lot of like applications come with like uh, like pre-installed fonts. Like for example, Figma I think has like a lot of the Google fonts um, because they're kind of like the standard of like what fonts are like most commonly used and like should be most commonly used. Um, and then we have font space. Keep in mind that like some of these um, fonts that you find on Dauphon, for example, um, are like copyrighted fonts. So like, let's say someone like makes a font and they don't want you to use it in like a commercial setting. So like, if you have like your own startup or something and like on the website, I believe like you have to make sure that you're using fonts that aren't like someone else's intellectual property. And I think you can check that like in the font description, but just make sure you're keeping an eye out for that, especially when you're designing for clients. Like you don't want to get them into any like legal troubles. Um, but yeah, and everything on Google Fonts, I'm pretty sure it's just like open use, like anyone can use it. I think it's royalty free, no copyright. So um, it's a good place to look. So yeah. Okay, and then now we are going to talk about images. Um, does anyone have questions about fonts before we move on, on how to use fonts? Okay, cool, awesome. Okay, images. So images are, interesting. Um, you know, I think like in modern web design, a lot of people have like, or like the trend has kind of strayed away from like real images and a lot of, you know, websites employ like digital illustrations, 3D rendering to portray images. Um, and you know, it's just a trend. So it's not like a hard and fast thing. Um, of course, images still can do like a really good job at like displaying to the user, like what a company wants to uh, get to them. So we'll kind of go through some rules for using images and how to like let them like help your design. Okay. So one common use of an image is called a hero image. This is a good example. It's basically like 
basically a giant image that shows up at the very top of your website. So like when it, the user clicks on like the landing page of your website, it's like the image that they see. It's usually really big. And sometimes it's used as like the page background, like here. Um, this page was designed by one of our designers in the industry branch, Daniel Wan. Um, he did a really good job. And I think like, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious like what this company is doing. It's creating fibers because like, you know, the background is just a giant fiber. So um, it's, you know, makes very clear exactly what the company does. Um, it matches with the logo, you know, it has like the same vibes, same energy. Um, and yeah, I guess it just complements like the website well um, and helps convey like what exactly users are looking at. So that's one way to use an image is just to like very, very bluntly show the user like, hey, this is what my thing is about. Um, look at it, shove it in their face basically. Um, and then this is another example of a hero image. I would say it's a little more like, you know, tied into the design. Like there's this little thing here. Um, but image colors is something that you should look, uh, pay attention to. Um, for example, here, this hero image has blue and black in it primarily. And notice that like the brand of this company is basically just grayscale and like a blue accent color. So the way that they like fit this image's color into the brand's color works really well because it creates like this cohesive image of like the brand. So, um, you know, like imagine if they use like an image that was just like orange and black or something, it wouldn't make very much sense. <clears throat> and it wouldn't really look that good. So keep in mind, like the colors that you put in an image are also colors that go on your website. So um, when it comes to using color rules, um, keeping those in mind, you wanna make sure you're not creating anything that clashes with like the graphic design of your site um, or your logo. And then I wanna go, oh yeah. And also stories, I mean, not stories, uh, images should tell a story. Um, basically it's kind of, kind of like similar to how a lot of news articles or like, you know, they have like this header image that kind of shows like what they're reporting on. Um, and it kind of like nudges to the user, like, uh, Hey, like, this is what you're going to be looking into. Um, this is a good example. Um, square is basically like, I think it's like transaction processing for like, uh, small independent businesses. And, you know, it's very clear, like this person like runs their own business. They are probably like a chef or something. They seem to sell jams and fruit cups. Um, so like this person's, you know, kind of like representing the customer that they want to serve. Um, and then like this text is framing their face, um, which I think, I think that's a nice touch. But yeah, like your images should always contribute to like what you want to get across to your user and like contribute to the story. Um, so yeah. It's, it's, I think this is a very good use of an image here. And then lastly, um, you wanna keep in mind responsiveness. Um, I couldn't really find any good examples for this cause you know, it's hard to find bad examples and like good websites. But um, when you're choosing images, keep in mind that like, it's just like anything else on the page. Um, you should always have an idea as to how to like make it fit different screen sizes like an iPhone or like an iPad rather than just like a laptop screen. Um, so yeah. Cool, does anyone have any questions on image usage? Oh, I, I'm not done, sorry. Wait, shoot. Okay, I, I'm missing one slide, unfortunately. Um, but basically, I was gonna talk about where to find images. So sorry, I missed this. Um, but there's a site called Unsplash, which is a great place to look for um, like non-copyrighted images. So like stuff that you can just use, um, I think, you know, of course there's like Shutterstock <laughs> or like those stock image websites where you kind of have, you have to pay for them usually. Um, you know, if you have a really good image that you want to use, like sometimes that's an option um, if your client's willing to pay. And then, you know, similar to fonts, you want to always keep in mind that whatever image you're looking at is someone else's work. So if they have given away their image to use for free, then like go ahead and use it anywhere. But a lot of times, you know, if someone takes a nice photo, they want like money if you're going to earn money from their nice photo. <laughs> so uh, make sure you're not using any copyrighted photos. I think this one's pretty um, common sense, but yeah. Okay. Also, oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. if you're using like royalty free images, would you recommend like keeping record of like, you know, where you got it from and something? Um, um, I would like proof that it's 
CC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that would be smart. Like, I feel like a lot of it depends on what client you're working for, but a lot of times, like, they won't necessarily ask. But you know, if they do ask, like, hey, where this is from, like, definitely keep the credit of like, yeah, like the website you found it from and like the photographer who took it, um, just to have it as like a backup. I've never personally had a situation where someone asked, but you know, it's always good to be safe. So yeah, that's that's a good idea. And then I'm gonna send the um, the website I mentioned because it's not on the screen. I think that should work. But yeah, that these are all like copyright free. You can use them anywhere. So yes, okay, cool. Okay, so we can move on to color. So unfortunately, color is Timon's like favorite thing to talk about. Um, so I won't really do it justice, but I can try. Okay, so color is a really good way to complement. Um, basically, like when the colors that you put on the website, you kind of want to make it fit like the, the overall vibes of your company, your brand, your product. Um, and like kind of shown here is an example of, I think, uh, a French uh, restaurant. I, I don't know really what, where Timon found this, but you can look. Uh, let's, let's actually take a look. I'm curious. But you can see that they're like, oh, they changed it. Okay, never mind. Um, this is what their old site used to look like. Um, ignore this. Uh, basically, you can see like it's first of all like the the green you know matches like the green in the logo and like their their accent colors kind of show up everywhere. Like this this yellow ochre color is like also shows up here. Um, it's super clean. It has like two to three, I think three colors max in like the main portion of their website. And um, this is a good example of like a good use of color. Um, you know, it's very recognizable when you go on the site, you're like, oh, like I know exactly, you know, what brand this is. If you're already familiar with this brand, that is um, just like if you go on Apple's site, like everything's super like black and white um, with like really strong like accent colors. Um, it's very unique to their brand. And yeah, so we'll be going over some color theory and how to make all your colors work for you on a website. Um, and color theory is basically just the interaction of colors in a design, how they work together, how they clash. And one like general rule to follow is to stick to two to three colors. Um, we'll go more in depth on that later, but two to three colors is generally the sweet spot because more than that, you know, detracts from like the cohesiveness, the cohesion of your brand. And then, you know, one color would just be awful. Um, actually, that just wouldn't even work. So, um, you know, I think two or three is a good, good place to land. Um, so, yeah, we have this, okay, time and hit a, that baby convertible in the corner here, which is just rude. Um, but the color wheel is a good thing to reference. Um, these are like different ways that you can like choose colors together in a set. Um, you guys probably learned this in like elementary school art, but you know, we have like this primary triangle um, and then the secondary triangle and then complementary complementary colors that are kind of opposite of each other. Analogous colors are um, right next to each other on the wheel. Um, God, these are getting specific. Um, square colors, it's a square. <laughs> and I'm not exactly sure what this is, but it exists. Um, you know, I'm gonna maybe have to double check with time on what that one is, but um, tint and shade. Uh, tint, I believe is like the like lighter versions of a color and then shade is like the darker, um, like how much darker it is. Um, these are, you know, like typically, you know, formalities that you don't really have to deal with. Um, if you like you can go on like hex code color finder um, or like colorwheel.com, you can probably find like a good set of colors and just eyeball it through there. Um, there's a few sites that generate like random colors palettes, which I'll try to send in the Slack after I'm like really blanking on what they're called, but um, those are fun to explore sometimes if you wanna just have some like creative inspiration. Um, cool, and then this is also kind of like what I was talking about earlier, but we have monochromatic, which is basically different um, tints and shades of the same color, I believe. And then analogous, which are the colors right next to each other on the color wheel and then complementary, which are um, opposite colors. And yes, Jasmine, that is the site. <laughs> Thank you for sending that. That one's fun. Um, cool. And then, yeah, on the topic of neutral colors, basically neutral colors are, for example, like this white background that I have in this slide, right? It provides some 
relief and from like just uh, other colors in your site. Um, obviously you wouldn't want your neutral color to be like a bright red um, because you know that's just a lot for people to have to like look at all the time. Um, people you know gravitate towards like something that's comfortable to look at and neutral colors create a contrast between like the stuff that you want to pop and then the stuff that you want to kind of you know use as like a secondary um, element and 50 40 10 is I think it's like something that people use in um, like interior design um, 50 percent of your space should be like kind of the negative space the white space that's like just neutral um, 40 percent of it should be the secondary color um, for example, like secondary color um, on this slide would be, I, okay, that's a bad example. I'm not going to go any further, but 40% um, is a secondary color and 10% is the accent color that um, kind of just like is there um, in like smaller elements and um, add some like personality and sometimes, you know, might even come from your logo or your brand design. Um, so this is a good rule to follow just for, you know, just to create like a website that people will be comfortable looking at. Um, yeah, and then contrast. Oh yes, color contrast is important. Um, you know, this also has to do with usability. Um, when you have like colors that don't contrast enough, sometimes like you can't even read it, which is something we'll go into later. Um, but contrast between elements guides your eye to the most like important part of the design. Um, for example, in here, we have like these very obvious blocks and it's pretty clear, like, you know, like here, your eye like immediately goes to this, which is, I think, exactly what they're selling. Um, so you can use colors and framing basically like in these color blocks to create like a sense of like basically like a hint as to where you should be looking, um, where the user should direct your attention to. And then color accessibility, like I was talking about earlier is um, kind of keeping in mind that like not everyone who uses a website will have will like interpret or be able to see colors the same way like obviously some people are colorblind and you want to be able to like account for that um, and to create color accessibility um, you want to increase contrast between text and background so like general there's a there's a contrast ratio between two colors that you can use um, I'm sure there's websites that like calculate this for you but on the left hand side here we see like bad color contrast. Um, like for example, this one is most obvious to me, like the, the blue and the dark gray, like they're both pretty dark. Um, and it's pretty hard to distinguish like exactly what this says without like putting a little bit more attention into it. But like over here, we have this super contrasted text. And, oh yes, thank you, thank you. Um, look in the chat for a color contrast calculator. And then, um, oh no. Yeah, and on the right hand side here, you see like these are very contrasted and very easy to read. And a general rule that you should follow is like, don't only rely on colors. So for example, here, um, you know, it's pretty clear to us, like, unless like you can't, unless you're colorblind, um, I don't mean to leave you out, <laughs> but it's pretty clear to someone who like doesn't have any problems with like uh, interpreting color. Um, it's pretty clear this is red, right? And like when it's red, oh, like it's usually an error. Um, but for some people, like they can't, you know, interpret that, distinguish that um, on a page. So you should tend to, uh, you should use colors and symbols together to represent like a message. For example, here they use this um, exclamation mark to show you that like, hey, there's something wrong. Um, you know, you can imagine if someone, you know, was red, green, colorblind, they couldn't figure out like where the error is occurring without like seeing this, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's important to keep in mind for everyone, um, just so that all of your users can access your page. And yeah, this is basically we covered this earlier. Um, you know, one one trick to checking your color contrast is just to put it in grayscale um, and see if you can still read it. I think that's like I think that's a hack that people use. Um, and then creating patterns and texture can also um, help people distinguish like where things are supposed to go and like what things are supposed to mean. So yeah, this is a cool diagram of normal vision and simulated color blindness. So yeah, good things to keep in mind. Um, another example of color contrast, um, this is the original message. And if you put in grayscale, it looks like this, um, not very clear anymore. So 
Yes. And then color motion guide. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. This is a very classic poster. <laughs> but basically, like, you know, there's this belief that um, the colors, like, each have, like, a different energy vibe to them. I don't know why I keep saying energy and vibe. Um, but basically, they give off different, like, values. And um, they can portray different things within your brand. Um, so these are just a few examples. Of course, this is not always true. I think for some of them, it's more evident. Like I think for black and white, you know, like it's pretty universal. Um, and then I think green is also one that, you know, it, growth and health, that makes sense, right? Um, Cause it's like kind of nature-y. But a lot of these like, you know, fall into categories with each other, but aren't like necessarily rules for how colors are interpreted. Like there's definitely some of these that are kind of out of the box. Um, so, you know, this is something that you can look to for reference, but I wouldn't like, you know, put your entire brand image on the line just for the sake of like, you know, appealing to these values or something. Um, and as you can see, some of like the biggest brands like don't really even have a color scheme. Um, you know, this is Google and like when, uh, what's it called? Microsoft, <laughs> I was going to say Windows, but Microsoft, like, uh, their color palettes like show diversity and like kind of free flowingness and it's you know you can use colors in different ways to suit your needs but yeah cool does anyone have questions about colors okay amazing sick so we'll talk briefly about animations wait one sec Sorry, my throat is dry. Um, so animations are something that you as a designer won't actually have to like implement into your website. Like, uh, you know, it's up to the developers to um, create, write the code that like makes the animation go, right? But as a designer, you should be able to look out for you know, certain standards and conventions when it comes to animations. So that like when you see bad animation, um, you know, like how to pick it out and you know, like how to fix it. So this is something that you can also like relay to your developers, like, hey, um, this is how long like this animation should go for, blah, 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 um, and make sure that like it's being done correctly. So um, as a rule, um, so animation speed is very important. Um, people, you know, users are pretty impatient, you know, like if they, something is taking too long, um, they usually don't have the patience to put up with it. Um, I've done this a lot myself. Like, you know, to be honest, sometimes when I'm playing like games on my phone and there's like ads, um, even if they're for like five seconds, I'm just like, okay, goodbye. And I delete the app. Cause it's just like, it's just annoying. So you can imagine how like this same like principle translates into your um, design. So for scaling and transitions and fading, which are like very brief animations, um, stuff that's just transitioning from one page to another, for example, um, they should take no more than like 100 to 200 milliseconds. Anything less than 100 typically is not perceivable by the human eye. Um, larger transitions should not go for more than 500 milliseconds. And that's just like too much for people to, you know, wait for. Um, and yeah, animation speed also de depends on the screen size. Um, it kind of, you know, like your animations should kind of follow like the rules of physics almost in a way. Um, there's this cool Apple video that I'm going to send to the Slack later, but it's very interesting. It talks about how like Apple design animations for their phones, um, animations for like iPhones, like for example, when you're on FaceTime and you like drag the um, icon or drag like your video screen, like it predictively like, or it like predicts where you want to drag it to. And then like it like creates like this cool like bouncing animation at the end to like it's just, it's cool I'll, I'll send it to you guys later won't go too deep into that but basically um your screen size obviously like you know when you're moving through like a larger thing like it wouldn't go as fast or like it wouldn't get to the end destination as fast so it typically is slower and then on smaller screens it usually um you can opt for a little faster of an animation um and yeah try to avoid like unnecessary animations not everything in your page has to be animated. Um, it's a lot of fun to do that sometimes. And, you know, sometimes it can distract from bad design, but, you know, after these lessons, hopefully you won't have to distract from bad design. So try to cut unnecessary animations. And as a general rule, like avoid cuts in your, um, 
avoid cuts in your transitions. Um, basically, I, I kind of show you an example of this in the next slide, but um, notice on the bottom here, we have like this person who's switching from one tab to another. On the left-hand side, we have like a jump cut basically, where when they select it, it immediately like jumps to the other side, which, you know, like looks okay. Um, there's certainly some applications that do do this, but like compared to this right side where like they're swiping between, it makes it feel like everything on your page, like every element on its page has, um, basically has a location in your interface and it creates like the sense of space um, and makes it easier for users to navigate through your um, application. Cause you know, it's directly showing like how to navigate from one thing to another and creating like directionality, which is a very like subtle, but super important aspect of design. Um, like I said earlier, animation should follow rules of physics. Um, I think we covered like CSS animations or something called easing where you know, like when something slows down, it shouldn't just like stop, you know, it should kind of slowly like decelerate as like a car does, right? Um, nothing goes from like 60 miles an hour to zero in like zero seconds, right? Um, so it's important to keep in mind how like things should naturally look in the real world. Cool, um, that's actually all that I have. And then Jasmine will be talking about brand design. Um, do you guys have any questions about anything I have presented about. Yeah, like what if you need to wait on like the network um, for some information, like if you're displaying content, I've seen a lot of like mm -hmm. people, especially like in, in mobile, like, or like, I guess in the web too, like they'll just like display like this, like it's not like lorem ipsum placeholder text, but it's like mm -hmm. a gray rectangle and it'll just like fill in and do like these animations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's a good thing, yeah. Um, basically, like when you're waiting on like network response or like waiting on uh, information, you should always try to create a loading state, which is like if your API like call hasn't completely finished yet and you're waiting on data. Um, this is kind of more on the developers to like create, but something that you should definitely point out is that like it's really confusing to users when like you click something and it's loading and it doesn't tell you it's loading right and you're like like is this broken or like should i leave or is there like not supposed to be information on this um so having like a even just like a simple like rotating circle that says loading next to it indicates the user like hey there's a uh, there's stuff that we're waiting on right now with you um and if you stick around for a little bit more um then you know you, the information will arrive and I think there's a lot of cool um, examples of loading states. Um, one thing I always think of is like the, you know, this is a little bit different, but when like, when you're on Google Chrome um, and the internet cuts and there's like that dinosaur game, of course it's not like, it's not a loading state, but it is um, like an example of them trying to make like the experience of waiting a little bit better. So there's some applications with like really fancy or like cute, um, loading animations that kind of distract the user from like the fact that they're waiting. <laughs> so yeah, that's a That's a good question. Anything else? Okay, cool. Um, then I'll hand it off to Jasmine, who's going to talk finish off the rest of this um, lesson. Cool. Thank you, Vicky. Um, oh, you're, you're not going to share. Okay. Oh, sorry. I can do it if you want. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Okay. I just thought it might be easier. <laughs> sorry if that was not clear. <laughs> I was planning on sharing like an example of a brand guide, so maybe I can just share myself. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I can totally do it. I just, yeah. Is it working? Oh, just kidding. Okay, yeah, Vicky, I think maybe you should share so <laughs> it's gonna be bad. Can you guys see it? Oh, shoot. Wait, does your screen share not work? Oh, no, I see it now. Working for me. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'll be going a little bit over brand creation, um, even though this is a little bit less relevant to 
um, like the work that you guys will be doing. Sometimes our clients will ask us to make logos for them or um, like in order to design a good website, you need to have a good idea of the brand. And sometimes the startups and companies that we work with come with us, come to us not knowing exactly what their brand is yet. Um, so these things will be a little bit more helpful for you while you guys are um, doing that work for your clients. So um, typically first, when you're um, starting out in brand creation, it's really helpful to create a brand guide. Um, and this is just like a guide of all the things, like all the design elements that encompass encompasses your brand so if you were to um, either like leave the team or pass the team pass the brand off to someone else or someone else were to join your team they could look at the guide and easily understand um, like how to design elements for it that are cohesive with the existing brand image so some um, elements to consider are topography which Vicky went over um, color layout core values and examples so as you can see in the example right here um, this is like a very simple version, but typically like for topography, you can include the um, what like fonts are used where. So what here it says oxygen is used for the heading. Um, usually subtitles are also used in um, oxygen and then they have a different font for the, the body text. So these are just easy examples to kind of streamline and like standardize all the um, elements across your brand so that it's not confusing to the user. Okay. So, um, one second. Okay, so um, this is like a very small example from Spotify's brand guide. You can see that they um, specified exactly how big to um, make their logo when it's in print, when it's in digital, and um, with the name and without. So a lot of examples like this are really useful just for people to know in instinctively. Um, Right when, they, why, right when they start working on the brand, they can say, okay, this is exactly the guideline that I need to follow to keep everything um, concise and cohesive. So um, some more examples. I, I don't know if this is pulled from Spotify's brand guide, but um, this was time and section. So um, here Spotify shows you where you can, where it's accept, acceptable to use their logo. Um, so it's okay on black, it's okay on white, it's okay on an image, but, um, it's not okay to put it on like contrasting colors or um, contrasting shapes or anything that would um, distract from like the, the hues and the tones of the logo. So typically when you're making a brand guide, it's really helpful to include these kind of examples just so um, the person who's looking at it can instinctively follow those guidelines. So I will show, you guys can see the other screen, right? Yes, okay. So this is an example of a brand guide um, from a company that I'm working with. This is a little bit more comprehensive than like what we showed you earlier. But um, here you can see they have like primary icon, monochrome icon, and then um, clear space and what not to do with their logo, just like we showed you with Spotify. So don't put it in a circle, don't elongate it and mess up the proportions. Um, and then also the different color schemes um, and everything repeated for the logo with the name. And then once again, do's and don'ts, and then um, sub brands um, and different like categories of their brand. And then of course they include primary colors and secondary colors, also extended color palette. Um, and always, always, always include the hex code. Um, there's no way if someone's looking at your um, your brand guide just to instinctively know exactly what color that is, even though they can use like the eyedropper tool, it's really helpful to include the hex code right here so they can um, match the color exactly. Yeah, and then general combinations. Um, so even though there's like, they have all these colors in their brand, you wouldn't want to use like um, this light yellow and this light pink together because they're both from the extended palette. So um, like uh, just the general set of, explanations um, combinations used for the sizes for all of um, the different um, types of text so like heading subtitles etc and then product elements this is this probably will pertain less to what you guys will be doing but um, these are like some more examples of things that they included in their brand guide and also like brand elements so um, you guys may not need to make these, but a lot of brands will have like um, distinctive elements that um, for you to add to like all of their like marketing materials or design materials or even their website. So these are some of them here and you can like change the colors um, 
yeah, so this has been really helpful just working with the company, knowing exactly what they can't do and um, being able to extract the elements directly from this Figma file and adding it to our, um, our design so we know that we're not going against their brand image. Okay, cool. So getting started on designing a brand after, I guess this would be before you make your brand guide, consider a little bit about your mission and purpose. Why exactly you, or why exactly your company, the client that you're working for or the company that you're starting, um, why you guys are doing it, what your, what your purpose is and how exactly you can reflect that in your design. Um, color scheme, once again, there's a lot of really cool um, like color matching applications that you can use to sort of play around with and see what you feel like um, defines your brand, topography, imagery, and iconography. Um, I forgot, Vicky, if you went over this, but similar to imagery, these are just like the small, I guess that would be like um, in the example here, like these are examples of like small shapes and icons that um, they, that they want us to use. So consider like things that you want to be replicated throughout your brand that um, would define who you are and that you want to um, show like make you like uh step apart from from your competition and as always balance inspiration and your own creativity we know that we've showed you like a lot of good examples of different brands and different designs but make sure that you're not completely just drawing inspiration inspiration from um, other people's companies and you're including a little bit of your own ideas it's definitely okay to take inspiration um, and replicate something that you really like but make sure that you're adding a little bit of your own style in there as well okay so um this was time and slide but this is um a logo that time and designed i believe for one of our clients so the final logo is this one on the right and you can just see the different stages that he went through um so i don't exactly know what his process was for this, but you can see the final one is a lot more versatile. It's a lot more um, universal. So you can, it um, can be applied on a lot of different services, whereas this one has more dimension and it's a little bit harder to translate to different elements. Okay. Oh, it's not going. Okay, there we go. So um, rather than like lecturing to you guys about how exactly to start a brand. Um, we thought it would be more relevant to share how, like what kind of questions you should ask when you're designing a brand for your clients. Um, Cause a lot of times um, if you don't have as much experience with it, it's hard to get um, started, especially if your client doesn't provide you with a lot of information. So here's just some basic like questions that would be helpful for you. Um, besides the basics like name, services, private and target audience, et cetera, you want to ask them why their company was started in the first place and what their motivation is behind their company. Um, so you can really try and communicate that because ultimately that's what sets them apart from their competition. Um, if they have anything special like um, about their company, like the Barracuda Tech one is like everything is natural. Um, that's something that sets them apart from the company and that's something that you want to emphasize um, when you're designing their brand. Um, one that I really like is if your customers described your company in one word, what would it be? Um, I think this is just like a fun one and a good thought exercise too. If like um, you don't exactly know where to start, let's say the, com the company was like, oh, my customers would describe us as playful and inviting, then that is already a really good um, starting ground to get an idea of what kind of brand you want. Um, and then what are the strengths and weaknesses of your company? Of course, you want to emphasize the strengths and um, not show the weaknesses when you're designing the brand. So translating brand image to web design. So um, sometimes your clients will either like come with a set idea already in mind, or sometimes they'll ask you to design it from scratch. So once again, this question is really helpful. If your company was a person, what adjectives would you use to describe it? So on the left, if, um, if the adjective was like playful, creative, inviting, something like that, this is an example of what it would look like. Um, of course, it could go a lot of different ways, but you can obviously see th the difference between the left and the right. The right one would be more like professional, modern, um, um, clean, something like that. Cool. And then, so for logo design, um, this is a really good skill to have just in general, even if you're not planning on going into like UI or, 
or um, brand development. So the logo is like the title of an essay. You typically would want to consider all the other elements first, like color scheme, topography, mission values, and then the logo is the last thing that encompasses all of those things in a simple icon. So um, once again, you want to visualize the company mission. And um, as we said a lot of times before, this is the first impression of your brand. So you want to make sure that it's really recognizable and really communicates um, what your brand is all about. So you can see here, typically it's um, nice to, we'll go through like some things you should consider here, but um, one thing is like if it should be simple enough to um, be recognizable and like um, be replicated on like a lot of different services like print and web, etc. But um, you want to make sure that it's distinct and still holds some personality. So um, a good thought exercise is, is if like you, if the logo were to, you were to look at the logo without its color and just the shape, you would still be able to recognize the company. So obviously for like Nike, if you saw this logo, um, you, everyone knows that it's Nike. If you saw like the outline of this mermaid, everyone knows that it's Starbucks. Um, so just some things to think about. Um, yeah, definitely keep it simple. Um, this may seem like um, kind of antithetical to like having a unique brand and a simple logo, but um, it doesn't have to be super extravagant to be um, to be very unique and still represent your brand. Um, you want it to be memorable, like we said. Um, make sure that that like even the outline of it is dis is distinguishable distinguishable from other companies, and that you can recognize it at first glance. You want to make sure that it's versatile so that it can be used on like print or t-shirt or anything and that like the colors in it aren't too um, like limiting. So if you were to like need a white version for something, um, for example, like this logo, it, it looks really cool because there's like shading here. But if you were to make this logo in all white, it would be a little bit less recognizable. Um, you want to make sure that it's appropriate, of course, considering what kind of client you have. Some clients, um, for example, if you were designing a logo for like a daycare company, um, make sure that it's appropriate for children, make sure that it's fun and playful. Whereas if you were designing a logo for like venture capital investors or something like that, make sure that it's um, more clean and more modern and professional. And last thing is make sure that it's timeless. So um, this, I think, speaks for itself. Um, just make sure that it stands the test of time. Do we have, no, we don't, we don't have examples. But um, car logos are a really good example of this. Um, they are they are like elements that don't, um, aren't like too trendy and don't get old with time. And so people can recognize them and recognize their brand um, through like all of the different uh, stages of their brand. Okay, does anyone have questions on brand creation or logo? Um, when would you choose to um, make a logo out of like styled text versus making like an actual like square um, like icon? Because I know some companies just do one, uh, just do like the text and like style it in a specific way. And some companies do both. Yeah, definitely. I, I typically would usually go for the icon and then you will always like all, most companies will have versions of their logo that are um, that come in like the rectangle version or with the text. Um, so just when you're designing lo your logo, it's helpful to keep in mind, like, would this look good with the text on the side? Would this look good in a rectangle, in a circle, etc.? Um, so we've changed the launch party logo since this one, but this is one of our clients. And so you can see like, this is the actual logo, but um, there's a version of it with the, like with the rectangle as well. I hope that answers your question. Ultimately, it's up to your brand. Some, um, some brands choose to have their logo like very simple and not as distinguishable. And it's just like their text. I think that's like a personal choice depending on their brand values and what kind of image they want to portray. But um, usually if you want to look at a more unique image um, and something that uh, makes you like distinguishable from your competitors, I think it's more helpful to have some sort of um, unique icon. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. So I basically what I got is just um, try to go for an icon when possible because it's more unique. 
Um, and most companies will already have their own version of a text-based logo. Yeah, um, yeah. so like for um, the example that I showed you guys earlier, you can see like they have their logo. This is, this is their official logo, but of course this is also a version of their logo, um, like with the text in the rectangle. So um, yeah, some, some companies will only have one, but most companies have like the icon as the official logo and then um, the secondary, like it comes with the text. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, there, thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions before we move on to um, UI elements? Okay, we were gonna do like a short exercise where we gave you guys like one minute to design your own logo. Um, <laughs> is that something you guys would be interested in? I think I think we can still do that just for fun. If everyone can get out like a drawing surface or like a piece of paper and a pencil. Also, before I move on, um, there's one question in the chat. Oh, I can't see it. Let me see. What is the minimum drafts of a logo do you recommend for a client? Okay, so typically I would start out with like, this is like a problem that I struggle with a lot is because I will make like a thousand different iterations with like one change in all of them because I can't decide what's better. But typically when you're presenting your logo to a client, you only wanna present to them like two or four drafts um, every single time so that they're not overwhelmed. Um, so you can narrow this down um, just considering all of the elements that we just went over. But um, typically another good practice is um, when you're presenting the logo to your client, make sure that you show it in white and black and in color. Um, also with the text on the side, without the text on the side, just so they can see all the iterations of it um, and can give you a better um, explanation of like their feedback. Okay, does everyone have a paper and pencil? Yes, cool. Okay, so we're gonna give you guys like one minute um, to design a logo for yourself. So um, you can interpret that however you like and tackle it however you want. If you have any questions, let us know. I'm gonna set a timer and then we can like share afterwards if you wanna share. Okay, that's a minute. I, I know that was like not enough time at all, but does anyone want to share what they came up with? Just for fun. It seems like people are still working. I can go. Um, I didn't really have time, but um, like with my name, I was kind of thinking like kind of like a Louis Vuitton, kind of you mix my two initials together. I didn't really do it the way I kind of wanted to. And then like the LT, um, I probably would have overlapped them a little bit differently, but then me doing kind of like blobs of kind of like watercolor-ish background to it. But then I was thinking about that like Louis Vuitton kind of like overlap. That's so cool. Like I actually that. really like that from the time that you had. That was really good. Very designer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leanne Ting sounds like a good designer brand too. That's true. Oh, big one. Maybe I should start a clothing company. <laughs> Yeah, does anyone else want to share? If not, we can move. So Figma file in the chat. I didn't get to finish the A, but that's Ooh. basically what it was. I like that. Yeah, I feel like Edward has a really good name for like a company or like, <laughs> Wait, honestly. The yeah. last 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I like. Oh, wait, it's blurred. It's just like a letter overlap. Even. It's also married. Everyone has the same but eyes. It's fine. Okay. Good job, everyone. Does anyone else want to share? No? Okay, cool. Yeah, so typically when you're, I know like one minute definitely wasn't enough time, but if um, it's helpful to do those like sort of design sprints in the beginning, just to kind of get your ideas flowing and like make sure you're not restricting yourself based on um, like different like color or sizing or like um, style constraints and just like put all your ideas out on paper and then you can narrow them down later. Cool, so we'll be going over UI elements next. I know there's like, I'll try and rush through it since there's, we only have 15 minutes left. Um, yeah, so cards. Um, oh, first of all, this is like not, definitely not a comprehensive overview of everything. There are so many different UI elements and we'll like send links to like places and resources where you can read up on these later. But um, these are like the main ones that um, you'll typically see in different UI designs and um, are just like helpful terms to know. So a card is basically like, we've included a lot of examples here, but um, it's like a little, not like a pop-up, but like a, a section for you to display a particular like item of information. So here you can see it on, I think this is Nike's. Um, they have a, a card for every single apparel item of theirs. And it includes all the information for that particular apparel. Same with Airbnb. Um, you can use for this one. I don't remember exactly what website it is, but um, um, yeah. So it kind of like separates your information in a very intuitive way. So um, even though there's like a lot of different blocks, you can still recognize that each block is um, pertaining to like one user, one item, um, et cetera. And then next is navigation. So um, these are examples of like different nav bars. You'll see that typically the logo goes on the left and then um, you will just have different um, names for the different sections. Um, you wanna make sure that you don't include too many because it can get a little bit overwhelming um, to navigate for the user, you want to make sure that's intuitive. And so sometimes you can include drop down menus if you have like too many subcategories. Um, that's a way to kind of simplify the information at first glance so that if, like if the user wanted to interact with them more, they have the opportunity to, but it's not like um, in their face when they first go on the website. Yeah, and you want to make sure if you do include icons that they are um, like intuitive and that the user can understand it without having any like design knowledge. So for example, like login, you can easily, everyone easily recognizes this icon as like either a profile or a login. And like, you can see that um, the sort of grid thing usually connotes to like a, um, like a gallery or a sort of menu or something like that. So um, now mobile navigation, this, um, a little bit harder to you have to really consider what um, your icons are meaning and how you can um, like guide your user through all of the same elements with less space. So um, to save visual space, it's helpful to use icons like this that everyone recognizes. Once again, um, this connotes to a menu. So they, the user knows that even though there's like two icons here, they know that when you click on this one, they have a bunch more options. Um, so these are something called like mental models. They already know what it is and they know what to expect from it. Um, usually for navigation, don't. Um, it's generally good practice to not include things that like aren't super common or intuitive to the user. So you don't want to use icons that like um, have never been seen before. Um, and so if you are including icons, it's also helpful to include the, um, the title of the category since you, once again, you have to consider that not all of your users know exactly what you're thinking. Um, and so adding text is always a helpful way to do that. And you can see this example here, they also like highlighted the section with a bar at the bottom. Um, that's not always necessary, but I think it's something good to have just so you can sort of um, be more connected with your user along their experience. And so, yeah, so mobile navigation has a little bit more um, like elements than web navigation. So there's the top navigation bar. Usually there will be a filter navigation and then a bottom navigation bar. Um, so while you're designing your navigation, um, you 
really want to try to think of the most logical way to go from point A to point B. So since you don't have a lot of space um, when you're like mapping out your user flows and stuff, um, think about you don't want to make the user go through like five different steps to go to one stage. Um, you want to make sure that everything leads um, very seamlessly and it's like a pleasant experience for the user. And so we'll go over more about like usability in the next lesson, but generally for now, just like some things to keep in mind. Yeah, and your footer is like another form of navigation. Um, as the name entails, um, it is at the foot of the website. Um, and so sometimes like these will have like a catchphrase at the bottom or um, yeah, um, sometimes directories, sometimes they don't, sometimes it'll just be like a home about section or like it'll have like these five sections, but some websites will include their entire website directory just so it's easy for you to navigate to if you wanted it to, but like it's not at first glance, so it's not super overwhelming unless you're actively looking for it. Okay, and then carousel. So carousel is like, um, when you take different cards and make them interactable and make them scrollable. So you can see here, these are some different examples. Um, you can make the carousel intuitive by like adding arrows so the user knows that um, it is clickable and there's more information that they can interact with. So what you will see a lot is like these little dots um, with the the dots that you're not interacting with um, in gray, and then the one that the slide that you are on is in white. Um, and that's just like a common way to let the user know, um, like, hey, there's more information here. You can interact it with it if you want to. And usually there will be like um, automatic um, and slide through them for you. But if the user wants to go at their own pace, um, usually people will include arrows. And the Nike website is like right here. You can see they have the cards, but they leave um, in their like view, they leave a little bit of it cut off so that you know there's more, more information on the side. So even though there's an arrow here, it's not as noticeable um, at first glance. And so some might think that like, um, if it was just these three slides and the logo, you would think that that's all there is to the site. But um, since they include like the cutoff here, you can tell that there's more information waiting for you that you can look at. Okay, and then button. So um, yeah, these are some examples of buttons. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can use to highlight um, exactly what you want the user to click on. So usually like the, the good option will be highlighted um, either with color or with shapes. So you can see like, um, if you want your user to click yes, um, obviously you can see right here, like the sounds good option is much more emphasized than the no thanks option. Um, yeah, you can use different colors that indicate um, like different emotions like we talked about earlier. Usually like green would, would um, indicate like, um, like positivity or yes, or like um, going forward with the flow or, and then red would be like error or something like that. Um, so yeah, when you are designing for mul mobile navigation, it's really important to consider the height of the thumb. So typically um, you wanna make sure that your buttons are at least 10 millimeters in height, just so it's like um, the user doesn't have to go through a lot of trouble to get to um, the button and to make sure that it actually clicks on it. Um, yeah, there's like, they have like whole maps of like the most like, reachable areas of your thumb. Yeah, you want to make sure that all your buttons and the interactions are within like this region of your thumb. And then like the less important ones are like in the yellow region. And then the less, less important ones are like um, in the red region, if that makes sense. Okay, and then states. So um, states are a little bit hard to explain, but um, Basically, like we discussed earlier, sometimes there's like a loading state and error state. It's just like the different stages of interaction for the user. So you'll see um, a lot of times states are um, communicated by these like on and off um, like state buttons. So you can see once you like click on this, it'll change to white and you can tell um, like what stage of the process you're in. Um, usually like the state that you're not in will be like in monochrome or a, a, um, really de-emphasized while the state that you are in is emphasized with color and, um, and text. Okay. 
Okay, so some examples of different states are like confirmation, warnings, and errors. So this is an example of a confirmation state. So um, once you like set up your account, it says, okay, let's go. And um, this is a state that confirms that you have signed up your account and um, everything is confirmed and you're ready to go. You can exit the page. And a warning state is right here. It, um, as you can see, they use the button to um, to emphasize that this is like the option that you should you generally should be choosing. Um, and then error state. So a lot of times, like right here, you can see the error state is um, you search something up, but um, there are no options. So it gives you an error or this is sometimes called like an empty state where like if you were to search something up on a website, but they had no matches for you, um, it goes to like an empty page, like on, for example, like on Yelp or something. <coughs> okay. And then forms. I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, yeah, you um, want to make sure that it's not, it's like intuitive and it's not too um, like confusing for the user to navigate through. So you always want to include like the, the title. And then sometimes you'll see like the name, the title of the category is here. But once you start typing, sometimes it's like you'll want to move it up so that um, the user still knows that that's the category that you're typing on. There's like a lot of different principles like that to make sure that um, even though it's supposed to be intuitive, like you're making sure you're communicating with your user at every step of the process. So um, you can see here, like even though it says work email, they have another um, section here that like indicates what you're supposed to be inputting in. And then once you input it, it'll have like a check mark that indicates that's your confirmation state, like um, your information has been verified. Four minutes. Okay, filters. Yeah, this is um, also quite explanatory, self-explanatory, but um, this is like an example from Airbnb. Um, yeah, these are just different ways for your user to interact with your information, but you want to make sure that it's um, it's not too confusing. And usually, like um, like you can see here, this one is probably not as good of, of an example because there are so many options and the list goes on and on. You want to make sure that it's um, you have like different categories that you can um, communicate to your user and they can easily see like what kind of information they should be inputting and what um, what the filter will do once you click on it, if that makes sense. Okay, I think those are all of our slides. Sorry, I went through that in like 10 minutes, but um, does anyone have any questions? We'll be sending out like more resources afterwards for different UI elements that you can read on and how to incorporate them into like a successful design. But for now, does anyone have any questions? Um, while you guys think, uh, I dropped the link to the homework or the lesson plan for this. And then at the end is the homework. Um, it's a pretty short one, like actually this time. I know I feel like we say every time, but it's pretty short this time. It's just like doing some commentary on some of your favorite websites. Um, and remember that your uh, UI UX lesson, I mean, homework one is due tonight. It's the one where you're recreating um, the web page. Um, yeah, so try to get that in. Um, submissions will be open late too. So, yeah. Okay. Um, if anyone, uh, if no one has questions, then I guess we can sign off two minutes early. <laughs> um, but yeah, feel free to stay after if you want to ask anything. Cool. All right. See you guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye guys. Thanks for coming. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I feel you. My, I was like, I, my throat is <laughs> dying in the middle. I only had lemonade, <laughs> so that was painful. Water, like in the yeah. middle, like, while you're talking there, because everyone is just waiting for you. I know to drink your water. <laughs>